Thank you, Dr. Herari, uh, Dr. Garmasani, all of you at Kanun and Tapuya for co-hosting tonight. It's good to be with everyone. Uh, I hope you're staying healthy and doing well. I know these are continuing to be a difficult, a difficult year with trying times. And as we head into the winter, I hope you all take care of yourselves and your health uh, uh, extra carefully. Uh, and I also hope all of you who um, can vote have voted uh, early. Today was the last day for early voting here in Georgia. Uh, and so I hope you've taken the time to do so. If not, you can obviously go vote on Tuesday. Uh, the lines may be a little bit long, but I encourage you to do so. And hopefully tonight, um, if you haven't yet been convinced to vote, you will leave saying, I need to go vote. Uh, so I, I wanna spend, uh, I only have a little bit of time with you all tonight. Uh, I have to leave uh, a little bit before 7.30 or by 7.30, but I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about civic health in the state of Georgia. Uh, teeing it up for, I think, what will be a great lecture uh, from Dr. Af Afsarzadeh, um, looking at, at um, the security of voting and how we protect voting integrity in, in the country. Um, I'm going to share a slide deck uh, with all of you and just walk through a presentation and then happy to take uh, any questions. So let's see. Excellent. Can you all see this slide just give me a thumbs up or a nod okay we're good so i, I wanted to talk about civic health in georgia um, uh, civic health uh, is a broad term it doesn't just mean voting it means uh, how we really engage with the world around us outside of our, our work and our family so how do we uh, talk to our neighbors do we talk to our neighbors how do we engage in our community how do we engage with government or media um, or the healthcare system, um, or for example, how do you engage uh, with Kanun? I mean, all of you tonight are engaging in, in civic uh, community uh, and the re relationships that you form being a part of Kanun or Puya uh, are part of having a, a, an active civic lifestyle. You have friendships and connections um, that make your lives better because you engage in this way. Um, so uh, why is it important? Uh, countries uh, around the world who have high civic health and states in the US that have high civic health tend to see lower crime rates because we trust one another, we talk to one another, we look out for one another. Um, you have better public health out outcomes, so our health is better. Um, stronger workforce development and economic resilience during depressions. Um, and that's most evident oftentimes in cities because if the economy turns south, uh, if you have strong civic health and you're engaged uh, and you lose your job, because you have a strong social network, oftentimes your next uh, job will come from the relationships you have. And so engaging in Kanun or in your community, in your neighborhood, or in any other organization that you're part of, um, this leads to actually better economic outcomes for everyone as well. Um, it also leads to better mental health for both uh, young people and adults. Um, I think we're all better off the more we interact with one another um, because it, it allows us to, to stay stimulated and to, to feel supported. Um, and it reduces mortality. We live longer the more we're civically engaged. My father's on this call. He looks very young, but he's getting, he's getting older. He will, he'll get, I'm glad he's muted, so he can't, he can't yell at me for saying that. Uh, he likes to tell everyone he's, he's 65, uh, but I think a testament to his youth and his old age is the fact that he's so civically engaged, uh, both with his work and with Kanun and, and other groups. Um, so, uh, Every few years, there's a civic health index, a study of civic health in states. And in Georgia, there was one in 2019. Uh, and um, the results were not great, uh, but there were some bright spots. Um, so we are below the national average for most markers or indicators of civic health. Um, there are a few exceptions that I'll talk about in a, in a second. But by and large, in the state of Georgia, uh, we don't engage civically as much as you see in other states around the country. Um, typically, uh, the, more, uh, the more high income you are, the more educational attainment you have, so having many advanced degrees, et cetera, um, correlate with higher levels of civic health um, that also correlate with better health outcomes, better employment outcomes, et cetera. Um, the one exception, which you'll see in a second, is uh, lower income residents of the state actually engage with their neighbors more. They spend more time talking with their neighbors than wealthy uh, Georgians. So where do we do poorly? We do poorly typically uh, in areas of, of uh, engaging with government. So we're 40th in voting in local elections. We're 44th in volunteering. Uh, and we're almost dead last in contacting a public official. 
as a public official, I will tell you, uh, it doesn't feel like we're 49th because people email me and call me all the time. I feel like I can never dig out from all the complaints I get or the frustrating um, emails I get from folks. Uh, but uh, I would say to you, if you do not contact your public official, whether it's your city council person, your school board person, your senator, your representative, your state senator, um, I would encourage you to do so because uh, it makes a difference. I will tell you when I hear from, from residents about an issue, if I hear from one person or two, per, two people, I may or may not think it's a big issue, but if I hear from 10 or 50 or 100 people, um, it makes me think twice about whether we should be acting on something. So don't hesitate to contact your public official. And frankly, the more local, local the public official is, the more uh, your voice in your call or email is really gonna matter. Sometimes when you call your US Senator, uh, it may feel like you're shouting into the, the abyss and no one's writing back, but at the local level, it makes a big difference. And I see it every day. So we also lag the rest of the country in actually discussing political, societal, and local views with our neighbors. We don't talk a lot with our neighbors in Georgia compared to some other states, uh, and we don't talk about politics uh, with each other that often, um, uh, nor do we work with our neighbors typically to, to do a lot. You see the biggest difference in this between urban areas, like we live in in Metro Atlanta, and rural areas. Rural areas in Georgia tend to have a lot more um, social connectivity amongst neighbors and collaboration amongst neighbors. Uh, this is one where uh, these two stats, I think, are contrary to this group. All of you engage with Kanun on a, a weekly basis, sometimes more than once a week with Kanun uh, and or with Puya. Uh, and you're members of the group. You oftentimes donate to help Puya and Kanun stay afloat, which is great. Uh, but by and large, Georgians don't do this very often or very well. We tend to lag uh, supporting groups uh, and donating to um, nonprofits or to religious organizations. And we are very, we are last in the country uh, in spending time or hearing from family and friends uh, and with talking with our neighbors. Now, I think perhaps the Iranian American community is a little bit different here because we put such a premium on family. Uh, we spend a lot of time with family. We spend a lot of time at Kanun. Uh, and this is uh, really counter to what we see from most of our neighbors around, around the state. And there's probably, if we were to dig deeper into this, I don't think the data uh, looked into this, but I bet you certain ethnic groups have much higher rates of interacting with family and friends and with spending time uh, outside the home with, uh, with organizations and neighbors. And here's what I mentioned earlier. Uh, if you live outside of a major city uh, in the rural communities in Georgia, uh, they spend more time talking with their neighbors than both the state and national averages. And if you make less than $35,000 a year, you're spending more time talking with neighbors as well. Part of that is you see this in across the world. Uh, when you live in a rural community, your neighbors are really your support system uh, and in many, in many ways your entertainment. You know, whether you're sitting at the barber shop for a couple hours talking to people or you go and sit on someone's porch, uh, we see that a lot more in rural communities than we do in the city when everyone's busy, people don't trust each other as much, they keep to themselves. Uh, so what do we do well? These are, two, these are the two areas that Georgians do uh, a little bit better than the rest of the country. One is we spend more time talking with people who are not like ourselves. We spend more time talking with people of different races, ethnicities, and cultural backgrounds. Uh, and even though we don't vote at the highest rate and we don't engage in political conversation very much, we are very active in posting about politics or societal issues on the internet or social media. So we like to spout off on social media, but we don't always go to the polls to vote. Uh, and here's a, a statistic that shows we're kind of the middle of the pack for the frequency that we provide food, housing, or financial support to friends or extended family. Again, I bet you that this is a little bit different for subgroups like Iranian Americans. It's probably higher in our community than in uh, just the broader general community. And you can see here that younger people and uh, Hispanic Latinx residents engage uh, in, in providing food, housing, money, and help at a higher rate than, than other groups. So how do we improve civic health? Uh, part of it is the more educated you are, the more likely you are to engage in civic uh, um, activities, whether it's voting, uh, talking to your neighbor, being part of an organization like Kanun or any other um, community organization. Um, there's a big push, I think, for a lot of groups that work on this issue to make sure that in schools, particularly in middle school and elementary school, uh, that we promote civics education. So the importance of engaging civically, why, why it matters, why your vote matters, 
what it means to write your, your representative and how you can help uh, shift an outcome in your community. Um, it, it makes a big difference when people have an education that uh, imparts upon them the importance of engaging with their community because otherwise people don't engage and everything from uh, the quality of the park by your house. I'll tell you, I have a park by my house and the city doesn't have the resources to take care of it uh, as well as neighbors would like. And so there's a group of residents who come together and keep it clean. They raise money to um, you know, buy new benches, build a new playground, and that type of engagement doesn't happen if people don't take responsibility for their community and to engage civically. Um, and then a few other ways we can improve civic health, uh, assure opportunities for civic participation among all populations. I think one way that government can do this better is making sure that uh, new groups of Americans, whether they're Iranian American, Asian American, Latin uh, residents, uh, that there's, they feel that um, government is, is also for them as well. Uh, I've tried to do that by hosting a Nauru celebration at City Hall, saying, look, this City Hall, even though you don't live in Atlanta, is your City Hall as well. But that even goes so far as making sure that ballots are, are printed in, in various languages. I know in Gwinnett County, they're printing ballots uh, and voting information in both Korean and Spanish right now because the populations are so large. If we were to go to Southern California, uh, we see ballots printed in Farsi in Beverly Hills and other parts of Orange County, uh, as well as a lot of other languages. And so these are ways to make sure that people feel comfortable um, engaging in, in their civic ecosystem, um, whether it's voting or, or otherwise. Uh, and the more face-to-face -face interaction we have, the better. Obviously, this is pre-COVID. Uh, we haven't had these opportunities as much, but um, I always tell people, I get invited to meetings all the time. And oftentimes I'm tired, I don't wanna go because uh, of my day is just meetings nonstop. But every time I, I drag myself to a meeting, I'm glad that I went because I meet someone that I haven't met before. I hear an idea that I haven't met, I haven't heard before. And it builds um, some, some connections that otherwise I never would have had. And I, I'm always glad that I, I took the time to go to the meeting. Uh, and I think that's, that's part of what um, civic engagement is. And then I'll finish by saying, you know, we are at a, a moment when the country is, seems to be voting in record numbers. We'll see how, how things turn out uh, next week. But right now, by all indications in Georgia and Texas and many other states, uh, early voting has already surpassed the entire number of votes that were cast uh, in the election in 2016. And we still have uh, today to finish counting votes and also all of next Tuesday, which is election day. Uh, but I would encourage you uh, not just to vote in these big elections like the presidential election, but also to vote in your local elections. Because I would, I would argue that most of the time when you complain about something in your community, it's probably because of a decision that was made at the state or local level. And if you have a pothole in your road or you know, the street isn't safe or the park isn't clean, uh, your taxes are too high, oftentimes it's your property taxes you complain about the most. Um, these are all local decisions and who you vote for in those local races uh, makes a big difference uh, as to how those decisions get made and whether they're responsive to you. So I will stop there uh, and see if there's any questions. Uh, I know I covered topics that weren't specific to, to voting right now. Uh, I think um, uh, Dr. Afsar Zadeh will, will speak a little bit to uh, trends in voting and, and the threat to our ability to get to the polls and to, to make sure our vote is counted. Uh, but I, it's really good to be with all of you and to see all of you. I hope this was stimulating. I'm still glad my dad is, is muted because my father would probably be interrupting and asking me questions all the time. And he's gonna tell me later that I probably should have worn a tie, uh, a suit and tie for this meeting. I didn't dress up enough, uh, but I, I can, I, I would say, Baba John, I, it's, it's Friday, I've been working from home and nobody wears a tie these days. I don't see anybody wearing a tie. So uh, he can yell at me later, but um, it's always good to see you. I hope I get to see you all in person. And uh, Dr. Hedery, I'll, I'll stop there. And I don't know if it's appropriate to take any questions now because I'm gonna have to leave soon. Uh, and I'm happy to do so, but if not, I'm happy to turn it over uh, to Dr. Afsar. Thank you for this opportunity. It's always an hour, honor to actually speak to the Atlanta community. Uh, the uh, Iranian American community of, of Atlanta has been the most supportive to uh, NTRC and RAF, and you're very much appreciative of that. And uh, just one clarification, I don't have a PhD, I'm not a doctor, <laughs> so I know that uh, it's an honor to be called a doctor, but I'm not. I just wanted to make 
make sure that I make that clarification. So um, as, uh, uh, as Amir John said, uh, it's, this is an amazing water level of water participation and registration. We don't have the numbers, but uh, just to give you a sense in the state of Texas right now, we are uh, over 9 million people have already voted in 2016, only 8.9 million roughly people voted. So it's way beyond 100%. And it's huge. And by the way, that's not really included in any of the poll uh, formulas. So we don't know what's going to happen. Two states, Florida and Georgia, are going to make announcements uh, early because they start counting their mail-in ballots early. And that'll be very interesting to see what happens Tuesday. Florida has also, uh, is over 80% in terms of uh, people who have already voted compared to the whole number that voted in 2016. Okay, let's start with water uh, suppression, our topic. The, uh, uh, we know that basically our American democracy is, is an expanding democracy. The idea of making a more perfect union the fact of the matter is, I'm going to start with a brief history. And Dr. Garam I assume I only have 30 minutes right now. So uh, from a historical perspective, unfortunately, voter suppression is in the DNA of American democracy. Uh, after the uh, founding fathers actually uh, uh, approved the uh, uh, Constitution in 1787, September of 1787, basically 6% of the population really had representation. And that is white men with property, uh, meaning that and, uh, out of 13 uh, founding states, only Pennsylvania did not have a property requirement. And this was actually kind of a um, um, heritage of the colonial times uh, and um, so from that perspective, only white men with property could vote. Now, <laughs> half of the population, women, couldn't vote. They were not, and uh, we've had this discussion multiple times that when it was said that all men are created equal, it was really meant only men. It didn't mean all men and, and women. And mm -hmm. we are very happy that finally after years of struggle, 144 years, it took until the uh, uh, 19th Amendment was finally ratified in August of 1920. We just celebrated the, uh, the centennial of that. So it took 144 years to expand the democracy to half of the population. Then of course, we didn't have uh, uh, African-Americans who were enslaved people could not vote and Native Americans could not vote. And uh, it took again close to from the Declaration of Independence until the ratification of 15th Amendment in, uh, in 1870. It took 94 years before it was expanded to all races of men. So, uh, um, uh, and the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments were absolutely critical because the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. 14th Amendment established citizenship for all people who were born in the United States or naturalized regardless of their race. And then the 15th Amendment made uh, discrimination on voting based on race illegal. So, and then pro provided the protection clause. And many people argue that even the protection clause could have actually been utilized to expand the voting to women. So we have had an expanding, uh, expanding basically democracy. Unfortunately, after the civil war, uh, we went through a period of 12 years of reconstruction between 1865 and 1877. It wasn't uh, all rosy, but it was, uh, uh, a, a revolutionary time in terms of expanding our democracy because at the same time that the um, three amendments were being passed and it was a it was a very tough actually struggle and the reason it was successful was because we had the union army in the south and we had a republican majority in the congress and we had some radical republicans who were activists and really stood for, a, uh, for an America where everyone 
every citizen's rights and participation in democracy is provided. And uh, Eric Foner actually talks about how African Americans really fought for their rights during these times. And they were critical to the, not only to the passage of the and ratification of the three amendments through bringing more African Americans to the legislative houses of the Southern states, but they were critical uh, for election of Ulysses Grant twice. Uh, and they actually had to fight intimidation, threat of death and all that, even during reconstruction. Unfortunately, we have seen that our democracy at times expands and then contracts. We have ebbs and uh, flows, basically. So ups and downs. And, uh, and what we saw after Reconstruction is uh, we saw the, a lot of uh, basically uh, discriminatory laws being put in place, uh, kind of a new enslavement of African-American people in the South. And, uh, and then, uh, we went through a transitional period and then finally in 1890 with the introduction of the Mississippi Plan or Mississippi Constitution, a whole new system of uh, discrimination called Jim Crow segregation was put in place under the false premise of separate but equal. Uh, it was actually separate and unequal. And all the southern states followed and the crux of one of the pillars or, uh, of the uh, uh, Mississippi plan or the 1890 constitution was to introduce all these different mechanisms to impede, and, uh, uh, black, impede black Americans from voting. Uh, literacy tests, um, uh, white basically um, 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 primaries, um, poll tax, all these were introduced and all Southern states followed. And unfortunately in various cases, Supreme Court actually, uh, because many of our constitutional amendments say that the Congress could put laws in place, Supreme Court supported what the states were doing and uh, segregation stayed in place. And uh, it took again, from 1877 to 1965, 64, 65, uh, we could say again, uh, close to 90 years with the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to bring back basically the uh, 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 voting rights for African Americans. And uh, what happened there was actually that uh, after the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, uh, Supreme Court actually uh, started making the Jim Crow illegal, but at every step, uh, segregationists resisted this in an organized fashion in the South, and it took a whole civil rights revolution, peaceful revolution, to force Congress and leadership of the country to finally uh, approve the 1965 Civil Rights Act with the tooth, because there was a 1957 Civil Rights Act that uh, uh, was, uh, I'm sorry, 1965 Voting Rights Act, but 1957 Civil Rights Act actually had provisions in supporting voting rights, uh, voting rights of African Americans, but it didn't have any notion of stopping the states in their tracks before they, they put in place uh, basically um, uh, all these different mechanisms like literacy tests, like poll tax, like white primaries, because the way it worked was that the federal government could come in and sue the states after the fact. So everything just got bogged down in the courts and it ju just didn't have the tooth. The 1965 Voting Rights Act uh, had the tooth and uh, the way it was successful was uh, it had a preclearance uh, um, clause based on which the southern states that had under 50 percent voter registration had to check and this basically uh, applied to all the southern states had to check with the uh, federal government first pre-clear any kind of change to their voting uh, to their voter legislations uh, or to to their basically uh, uh, voting rules and uh, also the, in 1964, 
the, uh, um, the 25th uh, Amendment, sorry, I keep forgetting the, uh, uh, the 24th Amendment in 1964 on the poll tax was uh, passed, uh, which basically made poll tax illegal. So, uh, so th this was huge because you have to understand that up to this point, uh, the, uh, uh, even though during the time of reconstru re reconstruction in 1867, the percentage of adults, for example, registered in Mississippi to vote was 66.9%. Uh, in 1955, after the uh, regime of Jim Crow had been in place for decades, it had been reduced to 4.3%. After the 1965 Voting Rights Act, the, uh, um, it took only a few years until 1968 uh, for voter registration in the state of Mississippi to go all the way up um, around 4% to 60%. And you saw this across the South. You saw this in Alabama, you saw this across the South, and it was a huge accomplishment. Now, did the segregationists of the past basically uh, went away and all became proponents of civil rights? No. Actually, they were very much organized. And uh, uh, right after the Civil Rights Act passed, the, the, uh, um, the states started to actually, um, different states, Virginia, Mississippi, started to actually challenge it in Supreme Court. Fortunately, every time Supreme Court, Court was able to support it and uh, uh, move forward. And uh, um, administration after administration, Republican and Democrat, extended the Voting Rights Act. Even George W. Bush uh, extended the Voting Rights Act until we reached uh, the critical year of uh, 2013 in the case of Holden County, uh, I mean, uh, uh, um, Shelby County versus Holden, Eric Holden. Uh, the Attorney General at the time, over uh, legislations for basically curtailing participation. And uh, in 2013, the Roberts Court, Court basically came back and said the 1965 preclearance uh, provision was no longer required because we have now passed, we are now past this, that stage and you're no longer a country that need uh, this kind of protection because we, we don't have the, uh, discrimination and, and uh, uh, racial issues and racism as we had before. Of course, the, what has, has transpired in, since the 2016 presidential elections has again showed uh, how much problem we have in terms of racial inequ inequities and what we have seen since the murder of George Floyd and the rise of a whole new movement. Yet uh, uh, this is a tactic of uh, saying we are post-racial uh, that has been used in the, fact, in the past. Uh, the repealing of uh, that part of the 1965 Voting Rights Act basically uh, made it toothless. Within hours from that ruling of the Supreme Court in 2013, states one after another started to put in uh, these different mechanisms of bringing about voter suppression and curtailing voter participation. Voter ID laws, voter purge uh, basically mechanisms making them lawful and so on and so forth. So what are these current tactics when it comes to voter suppression? Um, and wh why water suppression? So there, there are two uh, major reasons for, for this. The, the first and foremost, uh, there is the uh, claim that we have rampant water fraud in this country. Now, there have been various extensive multi-year scientific studies by Columbia University, by, uh, uh, by um, 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 uh, Brennan Center, by uh, Loyola University, by Arizona State, that have actually shown with facts and figures that the percentage of 
actual voter impersonate, impersonation. That's what is actually always claimed, that someone is impersonating as somebody else or non-citizens are voting and so on and so forth is minute. I just give you one example. There are many. You could actually, there are resources that show you all these studies, but there's one that stands out and was reported in 2014 by Washington Post. It was done by uh, uh, Professor Justin Levitt at Loyola Law School. And it showed that between uh, year 2000 and 2014, they looked at over 800 million ballots cast and they found 35 credible instances of impersonation fraud. 35, three, five out of over 800 million, actually over 830 million. I, I calculated the percentage is 0.000041%. Uh, if you actually just look at the rates, add two more zeros. That's instead of five zeros, you'll have seven zeros. It is, uh, it is very, very minute and low. And we have so many protection mechanisms actually established in this country to uh, um, stop people from doing impersonation. So from that perspective, it, it, it's that, that's a false claim. That's a false premise to justify all these tactics. The second uh, issue that actually is what's actually behind it is the underlying reason this is that we are a, a country with uh, significant changing demography. And uh, the demographic data is uh, startling. Uh, basically, uh, a Brookings Institute study tells us that by year uh, 2045, uh, will be a minority majority society, meaning that uh, the white population will be at 49.7%. And uh, uh, so this is something that uh, for many unfortunately Republicans who don't see uh, a way of, uh, another way of expanding the base of their party as a threat to the future of their party. There could be another way. And uh, basically many of them think that uh, they have to employ tactics to reduce the percentage of people participating in the uh, uh, election process. And uh, that is why these tactics are employed. So what are these tactics? Okay, let's talk about voter ID. What's the big deal about voter ID? Everyone has, everyone has an ID. I mean, why, why all the fuss about ID? Well, that's actually not true. Uh, a 2015 study by Project Vote showed that 13% of African Americans and 10% of Latinx people mm -hmm did not have a confirmed government ID. Mm. Um, there are in many basically rural communities of the South, older African-Americans who were born during the Jim Crow, Crow era at home do not have a birth certificate. And uh, so having a government issued ID is not as simple as many of us would think, especially in the Iranian community that we have a very high rate of education and economic uh, affluence. Uh, we really don't have, uh, we don't see this, but it is a huge problem if you want to have a particip participatory democracy. Second to that, we have also observed that uh, in many cases, the Republican legislators and uh, Republican governors have uh, utilized other basic, other tactics to uh, limit this using this voter ID. So for example, in, Al in the state of Alabama, uh, they, uh, uh, they basically came back and said that public housing ID, which is a government issued ID, perfectly valid ID, cannot be used. They have done this in many different uh, states uh, saying what ID could be used, what other could not be used. Uh, and uh, you have to have, a, for example, a driver's license. And then they started in the state of Alabama closing the DMVs, Department of Motor Vehicles, so that basically uh, people, uh, it, they, they would make them more limited. Guess what? Uh, in certain rural uh, areas of the South, 
70% of African Americans don't have access to a car. It's very hard for us to imagine, but uh, it's true. And then even taking a day off, even if you have a car, going to DMV and paying all the fees to getting a, an ID, even let's say that you get a car, is, is a challenge. Uh, and uh, so, uh, so, so basically they have used different tactics, tactics around voter ID to do this. Next comes the voter roll purges. Now the voter roll purges are uh, more pernicious. Uh, so for example, what happens is that it happens in Georgia, it happens in, um, unfortunately actually after 2013, this has been expanded to all the states in the country, to many states in the country, especially for example, in the Midwest. Just to give you a sense, in 2016, Hillary Clinton lost state of Wisconsin by something around 40,000 votes to Donald Trump. That was actually the very, that was the same number of votes of people who were purged, uh, voters who were purged from the rolls in uh, African-American neighborhoods of downtown Milwaukee. So it's, it's, it's not, uh, now it's not uh, basically confined to the South. It's, it's all over. In, uh, again, in Wisconsin, uh, we saw over 200,000 people were purged uh, from the rolls. So, uh, uh, so having said this, this is, uh, uh, this is a significant issue in terms of uh, uh, pur purges. And so what do they do? They, so for many states, they send you a postcard. And if you miss this postcard, if you have moved and missed this postcard, you could basically, uh, to verify that you still live there, uh, you could, they, they, they basically purge you. The other thing they do is that they actually go through uh, state databases, compare it to other states and other databases, and they only use the last name. I mean, these are very pernicious tactics. And most uh, minorities, African Americans, Latinx people, have common last names. And uh, they use, without cross-referencing the social security, to verify if it's the same Mr. Brown, or if it's the same Mr. Gonzalez, they basically get to purge uh, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions of people when you look at the, uh, across the United States. So that's the next tactic. And then, of course, in this uh, election, we have seen the notion of signature and how people's signature actually changes and so on and so, so forth over, the, over time. Uh, the other thing is that most African-Americans and, and actually not most African-Americans, most poor people and most young people rent and move a lot. So by using the postcard mechanism, you could actually get many of them purged from the, from the rolls. Okay, then next is gerrymandering. So I'm going to briefly touch on what gerrymandering is and how that is utilized. But basically, it comes from Elbridge Gerry, who was vice president of Mr. Uh, Pre president uh, uh, James Madison. He was the governor of Massachusetts, and he did this this the first time in Massachusetts, and he came up with a district. Uh, he designed the voting district that looked like a salamander. So that's why they came up with the term gerrymandering. It basically means you design a district and they use two tactics, packing or cracking. So packing is you put, for example, all African-Americans in one district. So you actually limit the representation both at the state level, state legislation level, at, at the congressional US level. So that's how you use it. That's packing and cracking. Cracking is you dilute, you do it in a way that you basically dilute minorities, uh, African-Americans, Latinx, Asians, many immigrants, or uh, 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 Iranian-American communities potentially in states that we have more population. So, uh, uh, so that's basically, with, by doing that, you limit uh, uh, their participation. You could actually uh, win the uh, uh, legislator at the state level and then control a lot, a lot of legislation that has to do with voting and with the whole election process. Now, uh, what happened actually was that uh, uh, in the 2008 presidential election, 15 million new people actually 
came and participated in the whole process. So uh, that is one of the key reasons uh, that in 2010, Republicans put a lot of money into winning the, ho the houses, the state houses all over the country. And it was just an unbelievable shift. And uh, uh, we're still, uh, I mean, basically the country is still trying to recover from that because uh, the domination was so significant that it has taken years. And uh, for example, if you actually want to have a more diverse uh, state house, I recommend to actually give money to causes that change, uh, change the state houses. Uh, because for example, right now, uh, there, is a, uh, there is an issue in this year's election with Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, because even though the governor is, uh, is a Democrat, they, uh, uh, there is a chance that if the election is close, uh, the uh, state legislator, uh, legislative body could actually throw uh, the results of the elections out because it's not binding. And, and uh, um, the Constitution never said uh, that uh, uh, basically electors should be uh, should be elected by direct vote. It left it to the states. Uh, initially, actually, there were many states that didn't even have direct elections for uh, uh, for president. And uh, so uh, it could. That's that's actually a scenario that could happen. That the state legislative body basically comes back and says, because there is fraud or because it's inconclusive. Uh, and we have reached the deadline, we, uh, we're going to throw this out and send our Republican electors to, the, uh, uh, to, to participate in the Electoral College. So that's why gerrymandering is significant. I have about five minutes left. Intimidation of minority voters is another tactic that is uh, highly employed. Uh, in uh, uh, Acting Secretary of State of Texas at the time in two, January of 2019, all of a sudden came out and announced uh, uh, his name uh, was David Whiteley, no pun intended. He uh, announced that uh, 95,000 uh, non-citizens registered to vote and 58,000 of them had already uh, casted their ballot. I mean, this was like the, uh, 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 winning ticket of voter fraud. And uh, um, um, after basically it was investigated, it became clear that there were structural problems with the list and the auto, and tens of thousands of those 58,000 actually were naturalized citizens. And this was all uh, in a sense uh, um, uh, incorrect. Uh, so, uh, so that also tells you that there is a tendency to intimidate immigrants, uh, even naturalized citizens, not to vote. And we have seen that to a great extent with regards to census and census participation. Uh, and then last one, felon disenfranchisement. So basically this means that if you have, act, if you have uh, uh, con been convicted uh, of a felony, uh, you, uh, your voting rights could be curbed. Uh, only two states, uh, Maine and Vermont, do not have that. Just to want, want to give you a sense that all Western European countries allow their prisoners to actually vote from the prison. Prison. Forget about whether they 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 actually served or not. They actually encourage prisoners in England to participate in, in the elections. So, uh, um, so ha having said that, uh, 58 states have laws. Uh, three of them, Iowa, Kentucky, and Virginia, basically make people permanently disenfranchised if they are convicted of a felony. Six other states limit the restoration. Uh, there has been, there is actually a national movement uh, along the lines of restoring. Uh, uh, the uh, voting rights and uh, for uh, ex-felons. And it, it's the example of Amendment 4 that in 2018 in uh, Florida passed uh, overwhelmingly uh, at the state level. And uh, uh, immediately after it passed, it was just to actually to enfranchise, restore the voting rights of ex-felons who had not committed sex crimes or murder. And uh, immediately, they uh, again, the uh, uh, Republican state 
uh, legislators and the governor, DeSantis, they uh, put in a law that said, okay, yes, they can vote if they pay their fees and, and uh, uh, all their fees and uh, what's due. And um, we all know that's actually a huge issue with mass incarceration in this country, that people cannot restore their rights as, uh, as citizens because they cannot pay those fines and fees because they're uh, in uh, hundreds, uh, hundreds of dollars and they, they cannot even get a job when they come out of prison. So, and that went up back and uh, forth in the courts and right now is basically uh, is uh, disallowed unless these people actually pay all their fines uh, and, uh, and fees. Okay, so, uh, uh, and then of course there's partisan courthouse and lawsuits. What we are actually observing, if uh, Dr. Ganwistani, if you allow me for a couple more minutes, I actually want to talk about this because it's 2020 elections. This has, uh, this has been uh, 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 basically um, my 30 minutes are over. That was it. That was my time. <laughs> you actually had 40 <laughs> minutes, but the, the oh, I have 40 minutes. But the, you know, uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, we can actually use some of the time during the question and answers. Uh, so. We have had, this is an unprecedented election. Um, first and foremost, I want to give you a sense of what percentage of Americans actually, uh, of eligible voters in the United States um, are, uh, uh, are actually registered to vote. And then one, what, percent of, uh, what percentage of people actually vote? Roughly, uh, uh, based on roughly about 245, 250 million people are eligible to vote out of 330 million. That should be higher because 245 is based on 2016, 163 million people voted in the presidential election of 2016 and that was a 55.8% participation. That is low. Um, uh, or the 2008, election hit 58% mark, which, is, which was remarkable. In the 90s, during the Clinton actually elections, we dropped into high 40s. Uh, and uh, the last time we actually broke the 60% barrier was 1968. That tells you the state of voter registration and voter participation. Uh, so in 2016, we only had 55.8% of eligible voters participate. It's estimated that 25%, 24, 25% of eligible voters are not registered. That's something between 60 to 65 million people. And that is uh, um, among the Western democracies, developed democracies, that is like uh, one of the worst numbers in terms of uh, having a participatory democracy. That is why uh, Amir Farouki's talk about civic engagement is so important and it's so important for our community to participate and actually uh, push this forward because ultimately it is our rights that are endangered uh, if are jeopardized, if uh, the whole community of the United States is, is, uh, 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 goes away from democratic principles. So, uh, so just to give you a sense of what we're talking about in terms of uh, participation. Now this year, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Uh, if we hit 60%, that actually will be a breakthrough because remember, since 1968, we haven't. Even the 2008, where we had 15 million people register for the first time, we only hit over 58%. So, uh, the, uh, uh, what is happening right now is that we have observed that during the uh, uh, four years of uh, uh, Donald Trump's administration, we have had close to 300 uh, federal court judges uh, who have actually been appointed and uh, um, almost all of them have a requirement to be a member of the Federalist Society. And what is a Federalist Society? This basically means that uh, uh, we have to go back and look at what founders really had in mind uh, when they first uh, basically wrote the constitutions. 
or when they actually wrote the amendments. So this is, of course, we have two originalists, and that is uh, Justice Thomas and now Justice uh, uh, Amy Barrett, uh, um, ABC. And uh, um, so, um, which is actually, uh, it, it just, just give you a sense of, uh, originalists actually think that we should actually go back to original framers of the constitution and think of, see how they thought. So if you actually want to go back all the way back to how they thought, you know, we could, we could actually argue that women didn't have a right to vote. Half of the population didn't even have the right to vote. And uh, uh, slavery was justified and even legal. And Supreme Court of the United States in 1957 actually uh, um, uh, basically ruled that slavery uh, was constitutional. So, uh, uh, so that is, so packing of the courts at all these federal levels, and then now packing of the court in the Supreme Court is something that is of uh, true significance. Uh, Amy Coney Barrett uh, did not uh, um, um, uh, basically um, um, uh, approve, did not participate in two of the cases uh, right after she was uh, approved by, uh, uh, by 50, let me see, 52 uh, to 48 vote uh, in, in the Senate. Uh, but uh, she's going to participate in other th cases that, are, that keep coming. Uh, what's worrisome is that uh, many of these cases, basically there are hundreds of them, have to do with mail-in ballot because we are in the middle of the pandemic. A, uh, a significant uh, a share of these new voter these uh, voter these registrations and participations are to mail-in ballots because many people are very much worried about uh, about the pandemic, about COVID-19, and do not want to directly vote. Uh, we have we have seen uh, in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, in many in Florida, we have seen all these different cases in South Carolina go all the way to Supreme Court, and uh, uh, these many of them have to do with the extension of mail-in ballot counting, meaning um, basically if the postmark is before or the day of the election, could you keep counting? Each state has, a, has different legislations when it comes to how to count mail-in ballots. Not only how, how, how many of them accept which arrive after the election day, as long as they have a postmark date of uh, the election day or before, but also when to start actually counting those mail-in ballots. So from that perspective, there have been many back and forth. What's worrisome is that we now with this six to three majority in the Supreme Court, we could very well be in a position that Supreme Court ends up ruling on, uh, a, uh, a, on a case that will determine the result of the uh, 2020 elections. Remember in year 2000, uh, where we had the case in Florida, that over uh, the, the, uh, George Bush was leading Al Gore by 537 votes out of more than 6 million votes cast, ballots cast, uh, the, uh, or cast. The, uh, uh, the Supreme Court basically decided uh, in a five to four ruling uh, that uh, uh, the, the uh, manual counting of Florida should stop. It didn't rule that um, George Bush is president. It just said manual counting should stop. The Supreme Court of Florida had ruled that it should continue, but the Supreme Court of the United States ruled in five to four that it should stop. And basically it handed uh, the result of the election to, uh, uh, to George W. Bush. So, uh, um, a similar thing potentially could happen if we end up in a tie uh, and then uh, in a, cl a very close election and over a few electoral votes in a state like Pennsylvania and uh, uh, a 63 packing of the court uh, could really uh, uh, determine the election in a, in a way that doesn't really reflect the will of the people. Okay, so uh, uh, the, what's actually really uh, worrisome is what Justice Kavanaugh wrote a couple of days ago 
uh, in one of the rulings that basically said Wisconsin could not extend uh, the uh, counting of ballots or acceptance of the ballots that have uh, arrived more than three days, that's the law in Wisconsin, after, uh, after the uh, uh, election date. And this is what he said. He said that uh, 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 this is uh, um, um, wrote that election day mail-in deadlines were devised to avoid the chaos and suspicions of impropriety that can ensue if thousands of absentee ballots flow in after election day and potentially flip the results of an election. This wording uh, of the, uh, uh, basically the uh, uh, um, suspicions of impropriety goes back to that whole notion of made up suspicion of rampant voter fraud that we, we, we talked about earlier when a ju associate justice of Supreme Court writes that in uh, basically a decision that was made by in five to three in Supreme Court, that really <laughs> makes me worried about how things will pan out. Okay, I'm going to stop here and uh, uh, we could address other things like electoral college, history of voter suppression, and intimidation, uh, intimidation, uh, basically intimidation through lynching and so on and so forth, uh, if you want to ask questions. But uh, I had uh, a lot more about the history that I couldn't cover, but uh, I'm going to stop here. And again, at the end, just like Amy did, encourage you to vote. Not only uh, from a civic engagement perspective, uh, we got to vote, but we actually should make sure that our friends, our family, uh, everyone votes, uh, not, only, um, not only our uh, family members here in the state, our friends here in, in your state, in Georgia, uh, make sure they, uh, you, you talk to your friends and family all over the United States and make sure they vote, support them to vote. I, uh, I actually have done this in the past that I have volunteered to take people to the polls, drive people to the vote polls and help them vote. So anything you can do to increase participation, Georgia is actually going to be critical. Georgia right now is a battleground state and it will be critical to the future of democracy in the United States. And uh, uh, right now you are at over 80%, uh, well, well over 80% of, I can tell you compared to your 2000, um, this is live data uh, and you are at, you have uh, over uh, three, three point uh, three million six hundred twenty one thousand people have already uh, voted in the state of Georgia. This is well over eighty percent. So uh, you, uh, it's very likely that by Tuesday, uh, more than even hundred percent of two thousand sixteen have voted, and in Tuesday, uh, on Tuesday, there will be many, many more people who want to vote. So. Please vote, please support your community to vote. Please encourage your friends and family to vote. And I'm going to end it with that. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Aftaz. It was a very informative and very interesting um, uh, talk. Um, I'm gonna take questions either if you wanna um, put them in the chat box or raise your hand. I'll start with the first question on the chat. Um, from the Bagaris. Um, they thank you for your um, informative speech. Um, what is the difference between popular vote and electoral vote, and why does the electoral vote supersede the popular vote? So uh, basically, when the Constitution of 1787 was, uh, was written, uh, initially in the Constitution, the only uh, body that was uh, directly elected by the populace was the House of Representatives. And this is this, even the 6% we talked about in the beginning <laughs> of the population that could actually vote, the only body was actually the House of Representatives. Even senators were elected, they were left to the state legislators to elect. And up until uh, basically 1913 and the uh, uh, 17th Amendment, uh, that made uh, senator elections direct, uh, it wasn't by popular vote. President was uh, never by popular vote. 
uh, in the election, basically in the uh, third clause of section uh, one of article one of the Constitution of the United States, this verbiage was put in place in terms of how uh, people who vote for the House of Representatives are determined. And uh, until the, the 13th Amendment and later on 14 and 15th gave the rights to also African Americans and other races, up until that point, it basically said all, uh, uh, all people, all free people, uh, free uh, men, uh, uh, excluding all the Indians not paying taxes, and then three fifths of others. And those others, it meant slaves. It was uh, because it didn't want to talk about enslaved people in the constitution. Never in the constitution the term is used. How is that related to the like, electoral college? Uh, basically, the president is, is uh, in the Constitution, in the first, basically, seven clauses of the Constitution. The, pre the, the second clause has to do with presidency and uh, uh, the executive branch. And uh, uh, all the rules of electing uh, the presidency is based on something called an electoral college. Uh, an electoral college based in the Constitution is... Uh, the number of representatives, which remember is the only one directly elected. And uh, that clause, by the way, that I just talked about in the first uh, article also talked about the fact that uh, there should be a census every 10 years. So 1790 was the first census. So those representatives plus the two senators are the number of electors for each state. So you, add all the representatives from all the states, add two senators from every state, you arrive at 538. Uh, um, if you actually calculate, you'll see it's actually 535. Three of them are DC and that again,